this recording will cover the rest of Chapter 17, Avian Specialization. So we left off talking um, about um, the feet and the wings. And we're now going to move into some of the internal organs of the birds that are dramatically different from a lot of other animals that we're going to talk about. Keep in mind that your birds digestive systems are going to be quite different from the rest of all of the other vertebrates. One of the main reasons is that the birds have no teeth. So they're going to be basically swallowing prey items whole and their gastric apparatus are going to have to take over not only um, the breaking down of the food but also the and the absorption of the food but also actually the physical taking apart of the food items. So all food processing is going to be done throughout the digestive tract. The first structures that we need to talk about with the digestive system are the esophagus and the crop. The esophagus is similar to ours in that it is a tube between the mouth and the stomach. However, their esophagus allows them to gather more food than they can eat at any one sitting they're able to store additional food in their esophagus. So the crop is the enlarged portion of the esophagus specialized for temporary food storage. However, this is not the only thing that a crop is capable of doing. The crop can also be used for transporting food to the nestlings. And when you see the nestlings sticking their mouths inside of the parent's mouth, they're eating from this crop structure. And um, for some of the birds, this is where they will regurgitate the food for the young to eat. But then for birds like pigeons, the crop is where they produce what is known as crop milk. This is a nutritious substance, a milk-like substance that is produced in the crop structure of the esophagus. The young will then drink out of the parent's crop and it is a milk-like substance, so we call it crop milk. The hoisin is a bird who eats predominantly green leaves. Over 80% of their diet is green leaves. And they have developed a very different um, digestive tract than all of the rest of our birds. There is a picture of one of, of these birds on the screen here. They have a um, bacteria colony uh, inside and, and a protozoan colony in their crops that allows them to break down the vegetation that they eat. They do foregut fermentation that um, where the bacteria and the protozoa are breaking down the green leaves so that they can digest it better. This is similar to what we see in some of our mammals, um, but it is a different approach than other birds take. The stomach is different. Um, for different bird groups. The form of the stomach is really related to their dietary habits. Carnivores and piscivores, piscivores being those that are eating just fish, are piscivorians. They need to have pretty expansible storage because they might eat a large volume of soft food. Seed eaters and insect eaters are going to need a very muscular organ to do mechanical breakdown of their food. So um, the size of the stomach and the way the stomach works is going to be related to the different eating styles of our birds. And the stomach contains a proventricles, which is the interior glandular stomach. It is the portion of the stomach that secretes acids and digestive enzymes. In your birds that swallow very large items, so things that swallow perhaps some whole pieces of large fruit or fish or frogs, um, this is a very large portion of the organ. The gizzard is the posterior muscular stomach. This is going to do both food storage and mechanical processing of food. The gizzard uh, has thick muscular walls, and in many birds, this is where the stones or the gravel that they swallow is held in the stomach. 
um, because the gizzard will churn these stones around with the food and the stones will break down the food that the birds have eaten, similarly to the way that our teeth break down. Because remember, these birds may be swallowing an entire fish, a fruit, an entire banana still in its peel, perhaps. Um, but really, it's things like an entire fish, or um, as some of you might mention, remember, he's a ornithology. I mentioned once that there was someone dissecting an owl pellet where they found five baby bird skeletons inside of it. Imagine you're an owl and your stomach has to digest these baby birds you're going to need something to break down their bones. Or a fish, you need to break down the bones to, so that it can really be eaten. So the gizzard is going to be what allows that to happen. This is showing you in, um, in A, the, the digestive tract. B is showing the crop structure. C is showing, um, the gizzard and those are showing them for carnivores where as uh, i'm sorry um b is showing the the crop and d is showing the crop um in b you're seeing the b is showing the crop of a carnivore c is showing usually what is the crop of a seed eater whereas d and e are showing their respective gizzards f is showing the hoitsen what you might notice for seed eaters is they may have a very large gizzard because of all of the shells and things on the seeds that need to be um, destroyed. And we usually find that the length of different portions of the digestive tract will change depending upon, well, may change, but is definitely different depending upon the type of food that the organism, the bird is eating. This brings us to the intestine and the seca. The small intestine is the primary site of chemical digestion, similar to, um, well, like um, a combination, if you would, of our stomach and our small intestine. The small intestine has enzymes from the pancreas and enzymes secreted from the intestine that will break down food. The intestine is also going to be where they absorb their nutrients in the small intestine, similarly to our small intestine. The large intestines in birds are remarkably short because the passage of food for birds is very fast. For carnivores and fruit eating species, it may be a few minutes to a few hours at max. For herbivores, it's a lot longer. For an item to pass entirely through the digestive system, it may take up to a full day. The um, seca at the junction of the small and large intestines contains symbiotic microorganisms that help with fermenting plant material. Whereas for the hoitzen, it was in the foregut. For most organisms, it is at this junction of the small and large intestine. This tends to be a very small structure in carnivores, and very large in herbivores, obviously. The graph here is showing seasonal changes in the diet and how they relate to um, the digestive tract. In fact, how the amount of plant material relates to the length of the intestine. That is right. Birds' intestine length varies depending upon the plant material in their diet, and their intestine length can change over the course of a year. Birds are interesting. Um, many of your songbirds especially, this is what they see. They eat insects into the summer and then plant material in the winter. And the intestine needs to be longer to better process plant material. And then it can be shorter for processing insects. If you're finding this stuff interesting, or if you wanna take um, a course where we talk a lot about bird behavior, I am teaching ornithology next fall. And it is a field course, and it counts as a biology elective. Our last stop on the tour of the digestive system is the koi class. This is um, going to be that um, kind of like all important opening, if you will, for the birds. It allows them to temporarily store waste um, when water is being reabsorbed. They will precipitate 
uric acid in the form of urate. This allows them to basically fully return the water to the bloodstream. Some birds will have salt glands here that will excrete salt. They may have too much salt in their diet. And um, when you see bird nests, um, you'll frequently see that it's white with some dark colors. That white portion is the um, uric acid or the urate. The dark portions are usually fecal matter, but um, it can also be the colorations from the food they've eaten, especially berries. When you see purple bird poop, it's usually because they've eaten a lot of berries recently. Um, sensory systems are important for birds. And the senses that they're going to use may be a little bit different from our general senses. Birds are flying in rather rapid speeds generally in 3D spaces. They need continuous information about what is around them, what obstacles are in their paths, what's coming at them, and they can move up, down, right, left, all over the place. Um, and sometimes they also need to know about wind speeds and other things that can knock them out of how they're going. So they need to rapidly process sensory information to understand the world around them and to react to it. Vision is important in birds. This is their best sense for processing the information of how they're interacting with the world around them. Their eyes may remain active even when asleep. We believe that this is true for some small prey mammals, but this is definitely true for birds. They may not look like they're asleep even when they are asleep. They may not fully close their eyes either. For birds, the optic lobes are very large and the midbrain is enlarged and important um, in the area for processing visual and auditory information. So they have brain structures that are enlarged that match the sensory systems that they use. Generally speaking, birds don't use olfaction. And as a result, the olfaction lobes in the brain are relatively small. The cerebellum is however large in birds because it coordinates body movement that makes sense flight requires a lot of body movement and control of body movement and control of all of the parts of your body so it makes sense that this portion of the brain would in fact be enlarged in birds bird eyes in general are large enough that the brain is displaced slightly this is specifically true for owls as a large group. And the shape of eyes can be like a flattened sphere through tube, like as you see the pictures of different eye structures here at the bottom of the screen. A is showing a flat typical eye, B is showing the globular eye that is seen in falcons, and C is showing the tubular eye seen in owls and some species of eagles. Um, the reason that the eyes have these shapes, it's basically the result of putting really large eyes into a tiny, tiny skull. And in order to have really large eyes like an owl, you need these tubular eyes, which will result in displacement of the brain. They have in their eyes oil droplets, and these were mentioned a number of chapters ago uh, because they're found in other seropsids. These oil droplets are found in the cone cells of the avian retina. Droplets come in various colors. Um, we know of red, orange, yellow, and green. And they act as filters. The various colors of droplets combine together with the photoreceptor cells, and um, the birds are able to see different visual pigments. The function of these is relatively unclear, and we also know it's remarkably complex. From what we've been able to figure out, the red droplets are really good at filtering out reflection from the water, in part because water birds tend to have a lot of red droplets. 
birds that are aerial feeders of insects, we call it actually aerial hawkers of insects, where they fly around with their mouth open, swallowing as many insects as they can, they tend to have lots of yellow droplets. These are also birds that tend to be very active. Um, they're crepuscular, so they're active at sundown or sunrise. It may be that the yellow is really good at filtering out the sunlight during those times or helping to magnify it in order to help them see um, insects that they're going after. Hearing is important for birds, which should not come as a surprise because many of you know that birds sing a lot. But their hearing is specialized for fine distinctions in both frequency and temporal patterns. Some birds have the ability to sing lots of different songs and lots and lots and lots of different notes. Others do not. So both frequency and temporal patterns are going to matter in the message of a song. Their ears are smaller than those of a similar sized mammal. However, their ears contain 10 times as many hairs as a similar sized mammal. It allows for a more rapid response to sound information and a better gathering of the changes in sound information. They are able to localize the sound in space, and, and this can be really hard depending upon where you are, but they're able to do this by determining the arrival of the, the time of the arrival of the noise, the intensity of the noise, and the phase and sometimes the frequency modulation of the sound and comparing the information between the right and left ears. And it allows them to then figure out where something is. This is particularly true if the ears are further apart on the head or in some analysis we'll see where they are displaced with one higher than the other. They also may use the internal transmission of sound from the middle ear of one side to the inner ear of the other side in order to better triangulate or locate the thing that is making the sound. Birds tend to have large tympanic membranes, which helps to gather more sound and to amplify more sound, thereby enhancing their auditory sensitivity. Owls have the most acoustically sensitive um, hearing of all birds. They do have a very large tympanic membrane. They also have very large cochlea and their auditory centers in the brain are remarkably well developed. So one of the things that helps them are the placement of their ears. If you look in B, you can see that the skulls have in some owls asymmetric openings for where the ears are. So the ears are not across from each other. One is slightly higher than the other. This helps in gathering sound information and distinguishing information about sounds. The other thing that makes owls have such great hearing is that distinctive facial ruff. The feathers of the facial ruff are very stiff and they are able to change the shape of this ruff. Um, to act as a parabolic sound reflector. It is going to focus all of the sounds that they're hearing directly into their ear canals. And these ruffs may be asymmetric as well, allowing the owls to better locate prey. Slight differences in timing and intensity of sounds arriving in the different, in the right and left ears, will allow for better identification of the source of the sound. And we have found that for some owls, it appears that they're building auditory maps of their environment. Well, how good are they? Some owls can, at night, either in the snow or under leaf cover, hear a mouse and find it and get it on one attempt. So they hear so well that they can predict exactly where it is and where it is going and get it in one attempt. It's pretty impressive noise. I don't know about the rest of you, um, but I remember sometimes, especially as a little kid, hearing noise and going, oh wait, and not knowing what direction it was coming from. And owls can actually 
not only figure out where it's coming from, but potentially where it is going and hunt prey by noise alone. It is remarkable hearing, much better than what mammals have. Which brings us to a place where we are perhaps better than the birds. Um, for most birds, olfaction is not well developed. There are some that do have a well developed sense of smell. Um, the homing pigeons I had mentioned have a good sense of smell, and we believe it's related to their navigation. And for some other birds, this may be true that it's related to navigation and orientation. But one of the groups that tends to have a better sense of smell are your ground nesting or your colonial nesting birds because they may need to be able to find their nest and their offspring. And that can be hard if you're nesting along with, you know, a couple hundred or a couple thousand of your closest friends. Water birds and carnivorous and um, disciplorous birds may also have a good sense of smell in order to help them find prey items. And this brings us to perhaps one of the most interesting and strange things that we're going to talk about with birds, their mating systems, their reproduction, and their parental care. These will be um, these are behaviors that are fairly complex and they're the most conspicuous behaviors, the ones we've really well studied for birds. Most of our understanding of evolution and the function of mating systems of vertebrates is derived from the study of birds. And once again, if you want to know more, take ornithology next fall. Um, because this is one of the things that we've studied the most, this is one of the things we talk about a lot. And a lot of our understanding of behaviors in animals is a result of learning how to study bird mating and reproduction systems and parental care well. In part because birds are something that are seen easily in our ecosystems, they're relatively easy to track, and um, they're something that are common. And many birds have adapted well to human interference. I also want to point out before I go much further in this, we do not want to judge the birds by human standards of what is appropriate um, for a, for lack of a better term, relationship. I'm sure many of you have this idea that our birds are monogamous and everything is lovely and they have a male and a female and that's how it works. Um, that is not how it frequently works. These are very different mating behavior patterns than we really see in other groups. Um, just thought I'd point that out, but we're not gonna judge the birds for acting like birds. Um, before we talk about more about their mating systems, we need to talk about their social behavior. And not shockingly, vision and hearing are your major sensory modes of birds. We just talked about that. Um, and this is actually the same in humans, which is why birds make a good model organism for studying social behavior. Birds are, many of them, active during the daytime. This makes them really easy to observe and study. And most studies have provided information under natural conditions because birds can deal well with humans around them. We know that when we take an animal from nature and bring it into the lab, it frequently changes their behaviors. But with birds, we've been able to study them in the wild, allowing us to really learn how to do things. It has also allowed us to learn about how to set up lab studies and experimental studies in the field. And we've been able to see changes in bird behaviors and then figure out um, and extrapolate from that about changes in other organisms. So we are gonna talk slightly more about kind of bird feathers before we continue because feathers are going to be important in conveying messages and conveying information about one's reproductive status and gender. Um, there's three main pigment types for feathers that are widespread. There is the dark colors, mainly of melanin, leading us to colors of black, gray, and dark brown. There's the pheomelanins, which give us the reddish browns and tans. There's the carotenoid pigments, the reds, oranges, and yellows, which come from their diet. And in many birds, they may judge a potential mate 
on this intensity of the red, orange, or yellow, because that could be something that relates to their fitness, um, their ability to find food, and to find good quality food would be seen in the amount of carotenoid pigment they may have. If, in fact, they're a species that utilizes carotenoid pigments. And then there's the um, porphyrins, which contain some metal. These tend to fluoresce red when exposed to UV light, but when exposed to too much sunlight, these um, pigment types can be destroyed. They are most conspicuous in new plumage, and uh, they may result also in blue and green colorations, and these are, um, are less widespread, perhaps, uh, of the pigments. But feathers can also have structural colors. Structural colors are going to result from particles of melanin in the cells and on the surface of the feather barbs that are acting as reflectors and refractors of light. They reflect specific wavelengths of light and they combine this reflection with the pigment colors to intensify the colors or to even create new color or observed new colors. Well, what in the world might that look like? Um, this is gonna be related to the creation of iridescent colors. So iridescence is going to be the result of the interference of light waves reflecting from inner and outer surfaces of hollow structures. The hue is going to depend on the distance between those reflecting surfaces, and intensity is going to be dependent upon the number of reflecting surfaces and the colors that it's reflecting off of. The perception of the color is going to depend on the angle of your view. You can only view the colors that are reflected towards you. As birds move, this may appear as flashes of colors and darkness. We can see here the hummingbird showing its head and throat iridescent colors and the peacock sh showing its iridescent tail feathers. So iridescence is going to be important in displaying information and um, in displaying the fitness. So birds are going to judge each other's fitness in part by how they look. So the health of the feathers and the iridescence of the feathers indicates that a mate is more fit. Vocalizations are going to be important, yes, but they're also going to be used along with visual displays. Birds use colors, postures, vocalizations in order to convey information about their species, their sex, and sometimes their individual identification. We have used bird songs as a study for communication models, and bird song studies are one of the um, important kind of subfields of neurobiology because birds have smaller brains, it may be, and they're easier to keep in the lab sometimes. They've served as good models of understanding communication strategies and the neurobiology of communication. Songs are gonna be different from calls in birds. A song is a long, complex vocalization produced by the bird. Songs are generally sung by mature males during breeding season. In some species, the females will sing them as well, um, but not in all. And in some, the females will sing a duet with the males. In others, they will sing a shorter song back, um, but the males are gonna use the songs in part to advertise their fitness. Different species, some species have one song. Um, marsh wrens have over 300 songs in their repertoire. So the amount of songs that a bird has will depend on its species. And in species where birds can have multiple songs, having more songs makes a male a far more attractive match to a female than one who only sings a couple songs. Because it means that his brain is generally larger and it means he has a better territory and he has more food for her offspring. Now, is the female bird actively thinking, wow, he's a better singer, so he probably has a bigger brain, 
which means he also has a better territory, which means he has more food, so I should mate with him because my offspring have a higher chance of survival. Actively, is she thinking that? No. Subconsciously, evolutionarily speaking, is that the process? Yes. Songs may be innate or may be learned, depending upon the group. There are some birds that only have the songs they were born with. There are others that are capable of learning songs. This is on a species division. Learned behavior um, of songs is controlled by the song control region of the brain. These are areas that are under hormonal control. And song learning and song production are, are linked in mates and, and as our hormone production are, are linked in males. And they may be capable not just of learning their own songs, but some have learned um, car alarms. Um, the mockingbird that I complained about last fall in ornithology um, had learned my neighbor's car alarm and he liked to sing it at three o'clock in the morning sometimes on the top of their chimney. It would be very annoying um, and loud. Um, he hasn't been around recently, which is kind of nice. But mockingbirds in Walmart are, are um, particularly good at learning songs. The lyrebird has learned the song, if you will, the word song, of a camera as it rewinds film and also chainsaws. Um, so birds can learn songs that are not actually songs, but are human noises and incorporate them then into their songs. As I mentioned, the vocal behavior of females uh, varies greatly across taxonomic groups, with some making only calls, which are very simple pieces of information, and some making the duet songs with their males. Um, bird song is a series of notes with intervals of silence. There are going to be frequent changes in frequency. Um, birds are good then at detecting these rapid changes in frequency. They often have more than one song. Um, and as I mentioned, some can have up to several hundred songs. And bird songs can actually have dialects um, or neighborhood information with them because bird song identifies the species and we've noticed that some have a regional dialect. The dialects are transmitted from generation to generation with young birds learning the song of their parents and that of their neighbors. So birds are then able to recognize their neighbors or newcomers to the um, neighborhood and then figure out who is who and determine whether or not it's worth defending their territory, if in fact they defend territories. Songs can identify the species, gender, and occupation or occupancy of territory than two other birds. To us, songs generally just identify species and sometimes sex. Bird calls are a little bit different than songs. Calls are shorter and they're usually conveying a specific message. A song is to attract a mate or to defend your territory, whereas in general, a call is, hey, there's a predator nearby, or wow, I found a whole bunch of food, or hey, are you okay over there? They are a specific short message. Birds usually use visual displays along with their songs. They may change their body posture to display different colors of feathers while singing. Um, males are generally bright, more brightly colored than your females, and this is a result of sexual selection, that females tend to pick the more brightly colored males. And females tend to mate with males with specific physical characteristics. They base the fitness of a potential mate based on whatever they are looking for. And generally there is a specific what they're looking for in each of the groups. Males with those characteristics have a higher chance of getting more mating. However, there is no guarantee that the characteristics that the females like are the characteristics that are actually good for the male. The characteristics may have no useful function in the, in the animal's ecology or behavior. In fact, if you look at the bird on this side, these characteristics may be detrimental. The bird on this side slide is the long-tailed widow bird. Think about that name for a moment. Long-tailed, that one makes sense, long tail, widow bird. Yes, 
um, the males have a long tail. The females prefer to mate with the males with the long tail, even if that long tail might get tangled in a tree branch and hurt the bird. Or it makes it a great target for a potential predator. And the bird may, in fact, get um, preyed upon. But the females prefer them, so the males with the longest tails tend to get more mating opportunities. And this brings us to the mating systems and parental investment ideas dealing with birds. There are a, a number of different mating systems, and we don't have time to talk about all of them in this. Um, but these mating systems are likely um, supposed to reflect the distribution of food, breeding sites, and potential mates. And there will be some kind of overlap between these where you'll be able to see how these work. But when it determines, um, when we look at what mating system is used, there's usually some, in our non-monogamous birds, there's generally some resource that one sex can control that the other needs access to. Whether it's food, whether it's eggs, whether it's a good territory, a good nesting site, we'll see. But if there is no one thing that um, is scarce, monogamy tends to be um, the, the default then because there's, well, enough of everything so everyone can find a mate. Males can increase their opportunities to mate by defending a resource that a female needs. He can then mate with all of the females in his area. His ability to do this is going to depend on resource distribution that is patchy or that is clumped. In an area where resources are evenly distributed, the males are unlikely to be able to have a territory to draw all of the females to. So if we look at our kind of big ideas of mating systems, there is monogamy. And in monogamy, we like to define it as one male and one female pair bonding that lasts for at least a breeding season. On the other side of that is um, polygamy, an individual that has more than one mate during the breeding season. But they're kind of, at least with for the copulation portion. In polygamy, a male has multiple female mates. In polyandry, a female has multiple male mates. And then we have promiscuity, where both males and females have multiple mates of the opposite sex. Um, we see all of these in birds. And monogamy has long been considered the most widespread in birds. And that seems to still be mostly true, but in recent, um, well, not perhaps recent, but in our, our studies um, where we started looking at the genetics of birds, we have discovered that fidelity is not necessarily true. Fidelity meaning that you are completely monogamous to your mate. Extra pair copulations are very common in birds. This would mean that the female sparrow from pair one sometimes mates with the male sparrows from pairs two, three, and four. And vice versa. Extra pair copulations are common in birds and it is more likely that birds are socially monogamous than they are genetically monogamous. Social monogamy deals with sharing the responsibilities of the nest and raising offspring that are, well, at least some of likely to be yours and the person you're raising them in the nest with. Genetic monogamy is that you're sharing the responsibilities of the nest and neither of you have had extra pair copulations. So in social monogamy, there's extra pair copulations, but you raise all the eggs in your nest together. In genetic monogamy, you raise all the eggs in your nest together, and those eggs are only the eggs of the parent of the nest. We, for a while, thought genetic monogamy um, was the predominant truth for birds, but it appears that it's social monogamy that is more widespread. Well, why might they be socially monogamous? Well, maybe you can't raise your offspring on your own. The incentive to being monogamous is that you need both parents 
to assist in raising your brood to fledgling status, to get them from eggs to fledging, where they can then leave the nest. Um, well, it might mean that you need one parent to stay at the nest to protect the young, while the other's out finding the food. A little dramatic for most things. Um, but in seabirds, where they are in these very dense colonies, this is very, very true. Both parents are needed. One guards the egg or the hatchling, while the other goes out to find food, and then they switch off and take turns. Um, in seabird colonies where both parents are missing, sometimes the neighbors raid the nest and either kill the egg or the chick. The picture on the screen is the northern gannet. What you see them doing is kind of tapping their beaks together. Northern gannets are a colonial seabird nesting population where um, they protect the small, small area around their nest, which may not be a real nest. It may just be um, a little um, indentation that they've laid their egg in. And they do these very um, important nest switching behaviors. They learn some sort of like a, I'm going to call it a secret handshake. It's not really what it is, um, but they have this behavior that they do that both of the mates know when they switch off duties at the nest to make sure that they're actually taking care of the correct young. And for your seabird colonies, your parents alternate guarding and foraging. And this ritualized switching that the gannets are doing there um, may be necessary. But this isn't the only time when social monogamy makes sense. Social monogamy may make sense if only the female is capable of incubating the young. It might make sense if you need both parents to be able to provide food for the young. So social monogamy exists because it's important for the birds to be able to raise some of their offspring, knowing that some of them will survive. But then why would they do extra pair populations? Why not put all of your energy into making sure your offspring survive? When you look at an, any given nest, the monogamy part may be deceptive. Depending upon the species and depending upon the study done, they found that anywhere between 10 to 40% of nestlings might have been sired by another male. So the male raising them may not in fact be the male that fertilized that egg. Wait a minute, why might this happen? Well, maybe you're the female of the nest and you didn't quite get the best male of the, of the area, but you wanna have the offspring by the best male of the area. So um, you're gonna go mate with him so that you can have some of his offspring too. So the females are gonna be able to mate with higher quality males perhaps than their own mate. The males will be doing exactly the same thing. You are also increasing the genetics of your individual offspring by mating with multiple partners. It also is going to hedge the bets against your partner, perhaps being infertile. It also reduces the chance of, for the males at least, all of your offspring being lost if that nest is a total failure. So the males are, spiring, are siring offspring with multiple female mates. And Sometimes in these extra pair copulations, what happens is that the females will then lay their eggs in um, another nest of their species. So you have both parents spreading around their um, genetic information. And having an extra pair copulation generally costs the birds very little, particularly the males. The females, it costs the construction of an egg. And spreading your offspring around several nests reduces the chance of having a complete reproductive failure for the year if your nest becomes destroyed. For the females, the really big thing is that some males are more fertile than others and some are completely infertile. So if a female meets, uh, mates with multiple males, there's a higher chance that at least some of her eggs will get fertilized and she can increase the fitness of her own male offspring by mating with a better male, perhaps, than the mate that she has. So then why might we have polygamy? Um, 
In this, males increase their reproductive success by mating with more than one female. And this is really good for the males that have access to more than one female. But in polygony, it means that some of your males aren't going to mate at all. Some males mate a lot, some don't mate at all is the result of this. One strategy of polygony is done by the red-winged blackbird, which is pictured here on the screen. He does what is known as resource defense polygony. In this, the male is controlling access to a critical resource that is patchy in its distribution. He will stake out a territory and his territory will attract multiple females to it. And he will have to spend a lot of energy defending that territory. That territory is gonna contain both nest sites and food supplies. So the females are then going to have to pick a male on whose territory they will have their nest and then they will mate with him or their offspring. A male with a very good territory may be able to have multiple females because being the second female on a better territory could in fact provide better security for your offspring than being the first female on a low quality territory. So if you have perhaps a male red winged blackbird with the, um, oh, let's say a territory similar to like a mansion, it's much better to be the second female on that territory than it would be to be the first female on um, a territory like a rundown shack because you need good nesting sites, you need access to food and water. And even if you are the second female on that territory and you're not the highest in the rank, your children still have a better chance of having enough food and shelter to survive. And then there's a different type of polygamy. This is what is seen in the greater prairie chicken, who is the other bird on this slide. This is male dominance polygamy. Our resource is not what is at stake here. Oh no. Males complete by demonstrating their quality through displays, beautiful displays, like the male greater prairie chicken is, is showing here. In order to display these traits, they gather in what are known as leeks, L-E-K-S. And um, for these prairie chickens, they will dance. They will blow up their cheek pouches. They will make lots of noise. They will use their feathers. They will dance around and they will try to attract the most females. So they're gathering in this area, having a dance off. And you want to be, if you're the male, the one in the center, because he's usually the best dancer. The females go from leak to leak where they stand around and they look and they go, okay, I'm gonna mate with that one. They pick the male they want, he mates with them, and then he returns to the leak to dance off for the next female to arrive. It means that some males will get most of the matings and some get none at all. In the resource defense polygony, the males without a territory or with a really bad territory don't get the mates. In male dominance polygony, the least dominant males are the ones who don't get to mate. Polygony sort of makes sense. Um, the females have a lot of investment in their offspring, so it makes sense they would stay and raise them. Polyandry is the one that makes a lot less sense from a female's perspective. Eggs take a lot of resources to create. If you'd use polyandry, you are creating eggs and you are then abandoning them. That's a lot of resource to lose. Well, perhaps not abandoning them, but you're leaving them with a male. But in polyandry, the resource that's being controlled is the egg. Females are controlling this limited resource and they get a lot of mates. The cost of Creating the egg, though, needs to be fairly low for the female. This needs to happen in areas where food is abundant and the clutch size of eggs, um, so the number of eggs laid at each time or with each potential mate, is small. This also needs to happen in an area where the probability of fledgling success, believe it or not, is small. If I spread out my fledglings across multiple nests, then we actually have a better chance of some of them surviving. Um, spotted sandpipers are ones that have these. The males form territories and the females move between territories mating with different males. 
She stays until she's laid three eggs with each, or three eggs, and then she moves on to the next male. The male provides all parental care to the developing eggs and then to the hatchlings. The female may return to a male if their eggs are destroyed to remate and relay a clutch of eggs, but she might not. If she doesn't, that male has lost all of his reproductive success for the year. This is not just seen in spotted sandpipers, this is also seen in um, some larger birds as well. And once again, the resource being controlled here is the access to the eggs and the female has all of that resource, which is why it works as a polyandrous mating situation. If you were waiting for an example of promiscuity on the best of the hummingbirds, um, in some ways the females mate with a male and then that is all that they have as any type of parental care. The male mates with her and he flies off and she takes care of the eggs. There are some other more interesting um, mating strategies that fall under promiscuity. And once again, in ornithology, we talk a whole lot about um, the behaviors and how this relates to bird um, mating structures. Once birds have mated, however, one of the next uh, most important things becomes the eggs and the nests. And before they're ready to lay the eggs, they're usually going to need to construct some form of a nest. Um, there are elaborate behaviors associated with both egg laying, parental care, and sometimes nest creation. But nest preparation varies greatly. Um, here we have a picture of the piping plover on the beach. They've made a slight indent and lay their egg in it. They may have actually, if it's a really um, great parent, rearranged the shells around it so that the egg looks like it's kind of lying there, but that is the end of the piping plover's nest creation. In case you've ever wondered why beaches are closed during piping plover seasons, it's because if a human or a dog or something like that goes through this area, you can actually destroy an entire colony in um, just a few minutes of time by walking through it and destroying all of the eggs. The fairy turn perhaps is an even more interesting way of picking a place to lay its egg. That is a fairy turn leg, or fairy turn egg, sitting on a branch there. Fairy turns lay their eggs on a branch. They leave it when they need to go feed and then they come back and they incubate it. As you can imagine, this sometimes leads to disaster if this is not a good branch or if it's a very windy night. The weaver bird, they're a little different. They construct multi-room nests, sometimes communal or family nests that can be used for generations. We'll see them um, on one of the next slides. Our birds are going to incubate their eggs in this incubation. They're going to be providing heat for the eggs, which is going to increase the speed of development. Some will stay and incubate all of the time. Other, uh, and some may have the female doing all of the incubation, and if so, the male is gonna be feeding her, and that's a situation in which monogamy would be necessary. Some will take turns and switch off who is incubating the eggs, and in some species, they will leave the eggs for a while in the sunlight to continue incubating. Cuckoos are, um, as well as um, cowbirds, are brood parasites. They lay their eggs in the nests of other birds and they never take care of them at all. Um, they let the other birds raise their babies for them. Um, some of the New World cuckoos that we have here do not actually do that. Um, around here, our biggest um, brood parasites are the cowbirds. This is showing you different nesting opportunities or different nest constructions. We have the piping plover um, with its indentation. And this one actually did put shells around the edge. Um, we have the eagle nest, which is a giant stick nest. We have the American coot nest in C, which is a mound of vegetation. And then in D, we have the Australian Maui fall. It's um, a megapod nest. It is a big um, mound structure that they have built. And I mentioned the weaver bird. 
This is a weaver bird nest on the start of one. The largest weaver bird nest may have multiple entrances and multiple exits, some to actually trick predators or to trick brood parasites, but the communal ones used for multiple generations are remarkably large with different nesting rooms for different family members. Um, for birds, reproduction only occurs through oviviparity. This is the method of laying eggs. Um, oviviparity may be a result of flight, that carrying around the developing offspring was just too much. So it may be a result of this flight behavior. However, none of the non-flightless birds have resulted back to viviparity though. It is thought though that they cannot, in fact, revert back. And this oviviparity is likely ancestral to the bird group. Unlike lizards, snakes, and all the rest of the seropsids, there's no advantage to holding the eggs inside of the female. Birds are endotherms, they're not ectotherms. So um, they're able to brood the eggs to control the temperature of the eggs. Egg retention provides absolutely no thermal benefit to the developing eggs. So viviparity becomes unnecessary. And we assume that this is ancestral because the crocodilians also laid eggs. When eggs are laid, they may start incubating them one or from the first egg being laid. And if so, the eggs will hatch asynchronously because birds generally lay one egg a day. Um, and if they start incubating from the day one of one egg, it will hatch at least a few days before the last egg. But some birds will not start incubating until they have laid all of their eggs so that they all hatch mostly simultaneously. This is a species by species thing. It is not a determination by the bird to start incubating or not. And um, they may be able to help synchronize um, the um, hatching of the eggs by incubating them all at the same time. Sex determination in birds is genetic, like it is in mammals. However, it, um, it's kind of the opposite of mammals. Um, females are ZW and males are ZZ. If there is no estrogen present, then a male develops. Estrogen um, is linked, estrogen production is linked to the presence of that W gene, uh, which causes the gonad to secrete estrogen and it makes the left gonad into the ovary. If there's no estrogen, that left gonad um, is going to later produce sperm instead of eggs. There is no temperature determination of sex here in birds. Um, we don't know whether or not this genetic sex determination is derived or if it's ancestral because some lizards have genetic sex determination and really incubating um, the eggs keeps things at a temperature that's constant, so it's unclear whether or not this is a derived or ancestral characteristic. Nest building, egg incubation, and care of young are really important aspects of avian reproduction. Why do we want to build a nest? Well, once you've laid your egg, you need a nest that's going to protect it from the heat, from the cold, from the rain, from predators. I'd shown you some that were shallow holes in the ground. They don't provide great protection. Um, we saw a weaver bird nest. Those are elaborate. They provide great protection. Many of you have seen the songbird nests, uh, the passerines, these cup-shaped plant weaving nests. They can provide decent protection. The swifts, some of them actually um, use their saliva to cement things together and to create mud. Grebes, use floating nests of aquatic plant stems. Provide some protection, perhaps not a ton. Most of our birds in general nest individually. There are some that will nest, however, in colonies. About 16% of passerines nest in colonies and 98% of seabirds nest in colonies. So you can see that it is, um, determined by your group, usually. 
Um, a colony is going to be a concentration of both nests and young. Colonies are good in that they do provide protection because there's so many parents around. There's a decent chance that predators can be scared off. They also provide the most protection for those in the central area of the colony. However, colonies are also problematic in that they attract predators. Diseases spread easily through them and um, the nest next to you may have a parent who could potentially kill your offspring if you leave it alone for too long. And before we get to incubation, the last thing that matters for eggs is the idea of clutch shells. Just how many eggs should a bird lay? Well, um, a scientist by the name of Lack developed a hypothesis that the maximum number um, of eggs they should lay is the, um, I'm sorry, the maximum number that they can feed to obtain optimum fledgling size is the number of eggs they should lay, which sounds like a really good idea. Um, the larger fledgling, fledglings are likely to survive, but the number of eggs they lay is generally either larger or smaller than the total number they could reach to fledgling size. Why? Well, lifetime reproduction output matters far more than the output of a single clutch of eggs. Large clutches laying them produces a lot of strain on the females compared to a small clutch. A larger brood means more mouths to feed. More mouths to feed means more foraging by parents. More foraging by parents means that the young are open to an increased risk of predation while in the nest with both parents out looking for food. Larger clutches are, all more like, are also more likely to be found by predators. They make more noise, they smell more, the parents take trips to and from, and in case you're wondering why they smell more, well, the young do everything in the nest, including um, rid themselves of waste, so they will smell more. So if you have a nest that is hard to find and really well protected, you could have a larger clutch of eggs, but if your nest is exposed at all, you're gonna have a smaller clutch of eggs. In some of our large birds of prey, they have three or four offspring, all three or four eggs that they lay, knowing that in the end, raising two would be a good year. This may mean um, that siblicide occurs, where the young actually um, kill one of their siblings, or um, that one of them just doesn't make it and the parents eventually um, just keep feeding the ones that are surviving. In your songbirds, they generally lay smaller clutches. They probably could lay a few more eggs, but they're balancing the lifetime output with the output of a single nest. I mentioned the idea of egg incubation. Incubation allows the birds to control the temperature of eggs during development. Brooding, as I'd, I'd already mentioned, is your most widespread method. Um, and some will start incubation after the first egg, others wait. I kind of already explained some of that, that um, if they start incubation with the first laying of the egg, the ones that are laid last actually have a lower chance of survival. Um, but most of your songbirds, your ducks, your geese, your waterfowl, they start incubating everything all at one time because that increases the chance of survival of all of the offspring. In order to incubate, the parents are transferring heat from their own bodies to the body or to the egg shells, to the, the developing fetus. I had mentioned when I talked about feathers that birds sometimes had unfeathered areas of their body. These brood patches are found on the ventral surface, they're areas of bare skin, usually um, tucked up by the legs. And um, there are lots of blood vessels in this area. In some species, these are only found in, some, in females. Um, in some species, they're found in males. Some don't have them. Ducks and geese create their own brood patches by pulling their own feathers out. So if you see a duck or goose pulling its own feathers out and it's the springtime, imagine that they're doing it to take care of their young, to brood their eggs. Penguins, as you likely learned from March of the Penguins, can brood their eggs on the top of their feet, and they have that fold of skin 
to cover the egg and envelope it for development. And for most brooding of eggs, the temperature range that's ideal is 33 to 37 degrees Celsius. Some can withstand periods of cooling, and if so, those may be the ones where the parents leave them for some time period. Incubation can be as short as 10 to 12 days from the time that the egg is, is laid to it is hatched, but it can be as long as 60 to 80 days. Your larger species tend to have longer times of incubation. There is a higher risk of predation the longer um, you are in the egg stage. So by shortening um, development, they're actually usually shortening the chance of predation of the eggs. Ground nesting birds have a shorter incubation time than do those who nest at higher heights. And those birds who build roofs over their nests or who have a nest um, that is usually in an area where it has some sort of top covering to it, those species, tend to have longer incubation times than those whose nests have no top to them, which makes sense dealing with the production um, of young versus the predation risk for the eggs. Our birds will provide parental care, and we believe this is ancestral. Um, laying of eggs, well defending a nest site, and parents at the nest site, then taking care of the young, all of that is part of parental care. And in many species, the young spend time with parents after they're born. The young are born either precocial, as you see in those cute little duck babies, or altricial, as you see in what are likely baby sparrows there. The difference is that those that are precocial are, at hatching, able to feed themselves, are covered in feathers, can fend for themselves, and have some level of self-thermoregulation. They're altricial, are naked at hatching, likely cannot open their eyes, have at best pin feathers, um, which you see those little feathers coming in, um, and are entirely dependent on their parents for food and thermoregulation. There are ducks and similar birds that within an hour-ish of hatching or less, can be swimming along with their parents. Clearly our little sparrows and robins do not have that opportunity. We find that there is a difference um, in the development of the eggs with each of these groups and then how long parental care tends to extend. extend. Altricial young are guarded well by their parents after hatching and the parents are gonna to need to usually regurgitate food to help feed them. Uh, for your precocial young, um, the parents may help them find food, but they're generally not going to have to regurgitate it for them, more like point it out to them. The duration of parental care is, var is pretty variable. These small songbirds usually leave their nests at two weeks after hatching, but being cared for by their parents extensively for up to one to three more weeks but they may continue coming back for months after that. Your larger species may need multiple months of aftercare from hatching and um, albatrosses need at least a year of care from their parents. And this brings us to our last topic with the birds, migration and navigation. Birds move over really large distances. Some bird migrations cover half the globe. Migration requires endurance and the ability to navigate well. While other animals migrate, we've studied migration best in birds. About 40% of the pale Arctic birds are migratory. Five billion birds are migrating at minimum every single year many of them moving thousands of kilometers. The biggest migration is the short-tailed shearwater, moving from the North Pacific to Southern Australia, moving a round trip of 30,000 kilometers. When birds migrate, they may migrate all at one 
um, flight, or they might migrate in short flights. They will frequently have stopover locations where they stop during the flight to replenish their food supplies. These may be short um, touchdowns to just feed and then keep going, or they may spend some time there and some of them will even do some of their molting there. Birds frequently return to the same breeding and wintering sites each year and frequently use the same stopover sites each year. The development of coastal areas is the biggest threat to these stopover sites and coastal wetland loss in particular is the biggest risk to these sites. Birds do migrate over large distances, but many birds are gonna migrate over this, or migrate through the same um, routes because these routes are gonna be really constrained by mountains, but also wind movements because many birds are going to use air movements and take advantage of them to move from one place to another. This is that short-tailed shearwater migration. You can see just how massive their migration pathway is. So why are you gonna migrate? If you're a bird and you work really hard to set up a territory, why do you leave it? Well, there are some advantages and the advantages need to outweigh the fact that you lose your territory and then you have to come back and defend it all over again. The benefits must be much greater than the costs. You are literally moving from one habitat to another. You have to find new places to eat, a new nest, potentially all sorts of things. And it is good to move if during certain times of the year, your normal food source is not available. So it makes sense why they would go away for the winter, but why do they come back in the first place? Well, breeding in high altitudes is good. Breeding in these areas that you can't stay in year round is actually good because there's enough food there during the spring and summer to raise your offspring. There is not enough food in the tropics to do that year round. So they're moving away from the equators in order to be able to raise more offspring. So the cost and benefit is entirely on their reproductive output. And then in the winter, um, by moving towards the tropics, they're able to save some energy and eat less by being in warmer areas. Migration isn't easy. You have to get ready to do it. It's a physiological preparation. You need to store a lot of fat for energy storage. Um, migration is going to be the result of a complex set of events where physiology and behavior are linked. So in order to put on all of that fat, they're going to go through position, which is a period of heavy feeding and, and pre-migratory fattening. Well, how much? Fat reserves will reach between 20 to 50% of the bird's non-fat body mass. So they may put on half additional of their body mass. Fat will metabolize really quickly during migration, and in doing so, it will produce water. Many birds migrate during the night and then stop and eat during the day. It may take them multiple days to pack back on enough fat to keep moving. Caged birds um, of species that migrate, even if they have never migrated themselves, will get restless during migration time periods and kind of try to get ready to migrate. Um, this is something we have, of course, manipulated in research studies too. The migration is really well timed. You have to go at the exact right time. Preparing for migration is integrated with environmental conditions. Like what? Well, we've studied this pretty considerably, and we have found that day length seems to be the most important cue, and that the change, the shortening of day length, is an external stimuli that starts an internal process. The bird responds to changes in daylight and changes their own internal rhythm. Northward migration is gonna be induced by increasing day length. And 
um, the birds will have a circ annual cycle of building up fat reserves, getting ready to migrate, developing their gonads, reduction of the gonads, etc. The bird has an internal clock that will still run without outside cues. We see this in our birds kept in captivity, but that it's not perfect without the outside cues dealing with sunlight, that it needs some outside influence to kind of keep it set correctly. And once you're ready to migrate, how do you know where you're going? Orientation is gonna be focused on knowing what direction you're headed, whereas navigation is how do I get where I need to be? Homing pigeons were um, our best kind of experimental animal for this. I have family members who kept homing pigeons for many, many years. They're very easy to care for. And because of that, we've studied them very well. But we know that their navigation is complex and they use a lot of different sensory cues. We have discovered that they use the sun as a compass. On sunny days, birds return rapidly to their lofts and they arrive all in general, similar amount of time. On overcast days, we discovered these birds tend to get lost when you send them to go home. They use the sun as a compass and they look at its position as it changes from dawn to dusk. Somehow utilizing the sun position in their own internal clock, they are, for lack of a better way to explain it, telling time. But they use something else though when the sun's not there because they're still able to get back to where they need to be. They use the sun to set up where they should go and then they use it um, to kind of also keep their clock going. We discovered that their second mechanism of finding out where they need to go is the Earth's magnetic field. How did we discover this? Well, by strapping magnets to the front of their heads on cloudy days, we discovered they really got lost. Different birds have different types of orientation and navigation. Um, some are able to use the sun and polarized light to navigate, especially on clear days. Some will navigate by recognizing odors and familiar visual landmarks like certain buildings or signs or um, mountain chains or large rivers, large bodies of water. Others will detect low frequency infrasounds, ocean waves, so the movement of air masses over mountains. We have no idea how this works, we just know that some birds are able to do this. Some will use sun and polarized light to start themselves off and then switch to magnetic information on overcast days and then eventually use local odors and landmarks as they get closer to home. Some will migrate only at night and they will leave usually within that half hour after the sun sets using the sun as their kind of compass. They then may use the magnetic sense for direction. Some will actually navigate, we believe, using star information. But this requires some internal knowledge of where the stars are supposed to be and how the stars change position during the year. We also know there's a great deal of redundancy built in, that if one navigation system doesn't work, the birds have some sort of a backup mode that they can use. And they do have a hierarchy of different cues that they will go through in order to figure out their navigation and orientation. I am gonna post um, some recording with the bird diversity slides to explain a little bit of what more is not on the slides for those of you interested in that. Um, but this will be the end of the material for exam 